Welcome, everyone. It's uh, another Brap Rant this Friday, April 5th. And I have with me Game Logic. Game Logic, long time, man. How have you been? Or how are you, I should say? Good, man. Good, man. Long, I was just, were we just on Wednesday night? Yeah, we were. That's why I said that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why I said that. And uh, a big shout out to everyone in the live chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, do you see some of the regulars here? Twisted Sin, Ice Queen Gaming, and uh, AC. Happy Friday to you, by the way, sir. Uh, do me a quick favor. Hit the like button if you haven't done so already. And I'm going to drop a link here in the live chat. Please share the link on your favorite social media platform. Let everyone know that we're live. Again, this is a very, very uh, impromptu brap rant. So um, we're going to discuss a couple topics here. And uh, one of them is Hellblade, because uh, that, that news broke yesterday after... We went live on Wednesday night. And by the way, it's a great show. If you haven't had a chance to watch the show, please check out Wednesday's podcast. We had Detective Seeds on, who was actually on Mooch's show, Crossfire, last night. Second week in a row for Detective Seeds. And that was actually a great show as well. You can check out uh, Mooch's show. Mooch was actually, it's crazy. Uh, if Those who, who don't know, there was an earthquake in New Jersey, a 4.7 um on the what what's the what's the measuring scale for earthquakes i forget now yeah richter scale richter scale thank you thank you thank you thank you um on the richter scale and uh, i was on i was on a discord called mooch and he's like hey my, my house is shaking <laughs> i'm like oh okay and then uh lo and behold it in fact was an earthquake so he did feel that he's about uh he's a few hours north of uh new york city so he felt that out there and then spoke to my sister she's actually South of New Jersey, uh, it, outside Pennsylvania, or outside, I'm sorry, outside of Philadelphia, and she felt the earthquake as well. So, just crazy. You don't, you know, you don't. We don't get many earthquakes here in the East Coast, but uh, they do happen. We definitely do happen. I uh, felt one 13 years ago in Washington D.C. while I was working downtown in D.C. So, uh, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know if there were any major injuries. Hopefully, no one was injured. Um, but um, I know some of the. Some of the folks that I follow on Twitter that live in New York City reported being okay, so that's uh, certainly good news. But um, some other, uh, so we'll talk about Hellblade two again because that that was something that came out uh, was reported on yesterday, and then we're going to discuss the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the the Phil Spencer Xbox strategy because uh, we were discussing this on Crossfire last night, and then Logic, you and I've been I mean, we, seemingly we, we we seem to talk about uh, the Xbox strategy quite a bit at uh, every time that. Phil Spencer uh, philosophizes on the um, the industry um, and where he wants to see the industry go. But one of the things we've been talking about is this idea of bringing more games to more devices and reaching 2 billion gamers. I, I think that conversation, again, as most gaming conversations, isn't giving the nuance that it deserves. There's, I think there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle here. A lot of content creators, frankly, are talking about, um, you know, some of the more um, Xbox centric extreme podcasts that I've, I've, uh, that I, that I'm pretty aware that don't, don't really get kind of to, um, you know, into the, um, you really kind of pull that, that topic up, uh, apart and really kind of do a deep dive that, that it deserves. Because there's a lot, again, that's just not being discussed. And, We'll talk about that as well. Um, I, I do have some other quick news, though, that I wanted to discuss. Um, Yubiaki, who is the producer for Dra the Dragon Quest series, or, well, now it's 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 now known as Dragon Quest here in the U.S., but when it first released, it was actually Dragon Warrior, for those who don't remember, uh, on the Nintendo Entertainment System. I actually still have Dragon Warrior, the Dragon Warrior cartridge, and the and the actual box that it came in. I still have that. Um but uh, Yu Miyaki is apparently um, moving on from his role as producer um, on the Dragon Quest series uh, for another internal position at Square Enix. Uh, this is according to Bloomberg, uh, who who um, who was told by sources that uh, that uh, Miyaki would be overseeing the firm's smart uh, smartphone, excuse me, smartphone games division instead. And and it's also reported that Nier Automata's producer Yusuke Seato is apparently being considered take over Miyaki's role now uh, Miyaki has been the producer on the Dragon Quest series since 1992 uh, Dragon Quest along with Final Fantasy those are I mean RPGs that I grew up playing GRPGs 
uh, that I grew up playing. Dragon Quest XI is actually a really good game. I got to go back and finish it, but for what I played, it's really good. It's actually and and one of those big gets for for Microsoft Xbox. Uh, it was one of those games that came to Game Pass after it was released. I, I don't know how many people actually played it, but I remember telling people, "Do yourself a favor if you're on Game Pass, try out Dragon Quest. It's one of the better RPGs, GRPGs out there." So. So I just want to discuss that quickly. Um, so, Logic, I, I want to go to you about the Hellblade 2 news that broke yesterday. So, Hellblade 2 is running at, it's been confirmed to run at 30 FPS. And I'm sure you saw, you saw a lot of the conversation going on about... Um, the game releasing at 30 FPS. I, I do want to add, though, the preview seemed pretty positive about the game. I've I've read that, visually speaking, it's it's one of the. There's some people that feel like it's one of the best looking games this gen, or may end up being one of the best looking games this gen. It is running on the Unreal Engine 5. But um, but what are your thoughts about the game running at 30 FPS? Because this isn't the first Microsoft first party exclusive game to be to have a 30 FPS mode and not necessarily offer any performance options. Yeah. I mean, like we talked about earlier today, I don't, I, I mean, for, I mean, for me, well, let's, let's, let's do the standard three way breakdown, three way decomp. So for me personally, um, Hell, Hellblade is one of those niche games that is not in my wheelhouse or in my interest lane. Uh, I didn't play the first one. Uh, I was never going to play the second one. Uh, so largely, to a large extent, I I just don't care. Um, so that's one. Uh, two, how do I think it's going to impact the rest of the consumer market, the consumer base? Um, <clears throat> Hellblade 2 isn't going to sell Game Pass subscriptions. The people who were going to be in Game Pass so that they could get access to Hellblade 2 are already in Game Pass. Uh, Hellblade 2 isn't going to sell consoles. It's an incredibly niche game. What we think is we think that it sold about a million copies before Ninja Theory was acquired by Xbox. And then once they were acquired by Xbox, I think shortly thereafter, uh, it went it went into Game Pass. So it didn't sell consoles, and it didn't sell a huge ton more units in its second year. And, and it was acquired by Xbox relatively right up right right around a year after it had released uh, Hellblade on uh, PlayStation and on PC. So now the game's only going to come out on Xbox and PC. Xbox is a smaller market share install base. Um, <clears throat> so the amount of noise that this game is going to make is incredibly small. Um, it's only going to be accessible. Is it a? I can't remember. It's, it, it's a current gen title too. All only right. Uh, yes. Okay, so your addressable market is a whopping twenty-seven million people. Um, and then whoever's going to play it on uh, on PC, and and I, I try and handle the seventy dollar conversation on PC very delicately. Um, for certain types of games, you know, there's a group of people who say, well, PC gamers aren't going to pay seventy dollars for a game, uh, and we've seen and it's been proven that they absolutely will, depending on the type of game. Um, I don't think a lot of PC gamers are going to pay seventy dollars for this type of game, um, you know, on 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 Steam. Um, so, I mean, the, again, the amount of noise that this thing is going to make is very small, and I don't know that that 4K30 um, was was really going to make that much of a difference. Um, what difference does it make to the brand and the business? Let me actually flip that. What, what impact does it make to the business? Because of the things that I said before, I don't think it does much of anything. Um, what does it do to the brand? I mean, to, and now we get into like consumer confidence and how people feel about Xbox and you know, how that confidence buoys your sales and subscription and all that kind of stuff. But the, the first thing that I feel like is kind of dorked up in the, uh, in the news cycle of this is n it, it's not being mentioned as, um, as loudly enough that it's, 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 it's not 4k 30, it's 4k 30 with dynamic resolution, which means it's going to be coming in at resolutions lower than 4k and upscaling and the machine is going to dial that up and down depending on what it needs to do to maintain frame rate of 30 which means oh logic by the, way, the, the game is 50 dollars yeah. uh, uh cloud strike actually mentioned that and okay it, yeah, yeah, that's yeah that's good all right so yeah. i mean that'll give it a little more uptake on uh, a little more juice uh, on pc <clears throat> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I don't, I don't think that's like a, a huge pendulum swing, um, because again of the the type of content, the length of the game, um, and just kind of how it's going to appeal to PC gamers. Um, you going going back to the like the news stories that are going around. It's 4K30 at dynamic resolution, which means at its native implementation, the game doesn't really do 4K30. Um, and they are using this as a, I don't want to call it a crutch, but they're, but they're using it as an enabler to help it maintain that 30 frames per second. So the game's been cooking for a pretty good amount of time. Um, they've been acquired for a pretty good amount of time. So what this points back to, to me, is just these questions that I constantly have about how they're managing the production pipeline. Um, then the other thing that kind of sits on top of this is it's in a relation to the other things that are going on in the Xbox portfolio, which is that supposedly there are 10 games, 10 major releases, as Matt Booty terms it, coming this year, of which we only had relatively definitive delivery dates for two. Um, and so there are another eight. We're now in month four of the year with, as far as I know, no sign of those other eight games. Um, we haven't even been told what they are. Uh, and the next really big drumbeat we think we're going to get for, from a PR and marketing perspective from the GLT is in the summer showcase in June. And so that'll leave six months left. Maybe they shadow drop something then. Okay. So that'd be great. So now you're, you're down to the bottom six months of the year to put out seven other games, um, which I just don't, given what we've seen over the last two years, I just don't have a lot of supreme confidence in. Yeah. The only, the only games that I'm, I'm aware of like big games, um, this one, Hellblade 2, Indiana Jones, Avowed. Those are the three that I'm aware of, the big games. And maybe I'm missing some That's others. true. And does, it, does, yeah. does Avowed have a release date? I'm sorry. Uh, I don't th- – I can't, I can't remember. Um, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to look that up. I mean, Indiana Jones, yes, we, we knew that that was a date. That was a, We had a year date, a 2024 date. Uh, but that's one that I've held This is – I mean, that's – it's not. It wouldn't surprise me if that game slipped. And I think you know. I think they they may have pegged holiday season twenty twenty four. I can't remember. Yeah, I think so. But Valds Valds looks like it's targeting um, fall of twenty twenty four. Okay, and I'm pretty confident in Avowed. Um, but you know, you know, being delivered on time. Uh, you know, Indiana Jones. It wouldn't surprise me if that slipped to Q one twenty twenty five, which I also think is is fine. Um, you know that that size of a game slipping into kind of what has become that that kind of really opportune window of releasing at the beginning of the year is is, is okay. Um, the question I have is just around what what are, what are the other ones and and when are they coming in and what is our confidence that they're going to be delivered? Yeah, um, Indiana Jones. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. at I don't see. There's no definitive date. Um, yeah, I don't see anything with with Indiana Jones. I'm just trying to think like the the other. I'm not aware of the other big games that you're that you're referencing here, like that the other ten, you know, a total of ten releases. I know Ta- was it Towerborn being considered one of them. Yeah, and I think Tower. Well, I, the, the the problem I've had with the language is uh, Towerborn was included in the mix last summer in the wake of the June 2023 showcase when you know, as usual, the GLT went and around and did a bunch of interviews in the wake of their summer showcase. And one of the things Matt said was, uh, you know, it was that basically they were coming off of the notion that it was going to be four first party AAA games released each year into the sub- subscription service. And it was just going to be four first party titles in the subscription service. And by Xbox's definition, a first party title is any game that they fund and publish, regardless of whether or not it's done by one of their studios or not. Um, and so Towerborn was included in that in that four, right? And those are that that then those are the four that you mentioned, right? Towerborn, Hellblade Two, uh, Indiana Jones, and Avowed. Um, but then, but then this year, after the business update, he said we have ten major releases. So. That sounds to me like that's beyond just the four titles and it's it, it, it's anyone's game, like what the like budget and quality level or whatever those four titles is. It sounds like something above like in, like a Pentiment, right? Um, but not necessarily saying that that's a Starfield. So some 10 major releases intones to me something, you know, between AA and AAA. Um, not saying that that's right. That's just the impression that I received. So I don't know if Towerborn is in in that number or not because that's I think that's definitively an, an, an indie title and it's kind of a, a smaller 
um, level of title, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So you're not, I mean, you, you, again, you're, you're not, you don't really care about the 30 FPS thing per se. Like that's not, that's not, you don't have an issue with that, that design choice by the studio. I think from, from my critical perspective, um, you, you know, what I, what I will say is the creative choice to go 4K 30 for Hellblade to me, where I think what that studio and what that studio has articulated and conveyed is that that visual presentation is impactful to them and the delivery of their title. I have less of an issue with that than I have with Starfield. Starfield stated reason for going 4k 30 was so they could, they could track every piece of particulate matter from one end of the cosmos to the other, whether or not you ever saw it or ever interacted with it. And to me, for the genre that star of game that Starfield was in and the setting that it was in, where it you know it includes space combat and right, wrong, or indifferent, what what is the connotation that winds up in your mind and the comparisons that that occur are with um, Star Citizen and Elite Dangerous, um, where you know 4K 30 to me is a con, it's a negative. Um, making the decision to go 4K 30 for that reason, I felt was was not the choice that I would have preferred, particularly for a title that, I mean, as I articulated last, you know, last year and maybe even the year before, like you, you could make a choice like doing server side implementations server and, and having server side lift where you didn't have to have all that compute right on, on the box, right. That's sitting on your desk. Um, you know, those, those decisions obviously have trade-offs, you know, they made the decisions that they made. I just, it was, it just wasn't one that I agreed with Th this one. For 4K30 for a game that's like not super heavy in combat mechanics, uh, you know, we're not talking about a Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2 here, um, where quite honestly, the combat sequences, as far as I'm concerned, it, they seem like relatively gratuitous to me. Um, it's all it's all about story. I mean, as I mentioned to you today, to me, Hellblade is Hellblade 2. The premise of Hellblade 2 is is not you know, not that much of a lift, you know, stepping onto a sidewalk, you know, from being a, a visual novel. Um, so, I mean, I, 4k 30 to me, seems like a fine choice to make. I I'm, I'm more bothered by the, um, by the, uh, what did I just call it? Ver variable. It's not variable resolution. You don't want the, um, I can't, I literally that's, can't that's remember not, the, that it's not 4k that it's a uh, dynamic resolution. Dynamic resolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That dynamic resolution part is the part that bothers me because that, that seems like, you know, there were choices that they were making during optimization that didn't allow them to maintain right for you know four K. Mm -hmm. And that the only the only way to get it to thirty frames per second was to vary the was to Very, yeah. make the resolution dynamic. Yeah, yeah. I think I think for me the biggest thing was not having because I've, I've become accustomed to this with some third party games. I think Sony's really done a good job uh, with their first party games and offering performance options in games and I th like for me it would have been nice to have that performance option for someone like on console to have like a um yeah uh, uh jez is saying it also has the uh, letterboxing as well uh and that's that's very similar if you play the order 1887 had the, the letterboxing so it has that too and um uh, or it just calls it the black bars. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> yeah, but it has it has the letterboxing. Um, uh, but again, that that is very similar. Like I remember, like playing the Order eighteen eighty seven. That that was the case with that game too. But um, so I, I think like from a design perspective, like they're aiming for more of that cinematic type experience, which is fine. Again, I think for me, it just it would have been nice just to have an option because there are people that would still want to enjoy the game at 60 FPS. I know somebody was hounding me today. Oh, well, there's not a lot of combat. You know, uh, why do you need 60? Why do you need 60? Hillary doesn't even get 60. She gets 30 on a good night. I mean, you know, it's just, <laughs> I think I think just having that option would have been a nice nice thing to have uh, for those who want a experience at a higher resolution, or not higher resolution, but a, you know, higher FPS. You know, because those character moves are smoother. At a higher FPS, you know it's it's very hard for me now, Logic, to go back and play games that are thirty FPS. It's just very hard for me to do. I don't like it. 
I don't like it at all. You know, um, somebody said to me that uh, today Final Fantasy uh, playing the uh, graphic, the graphic fidelity or graphics mode on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was the best way to play it. I'm like, well, yeah, for you, for me, it's not. I, I can't, I cannot, I can't stomach that game at 30 FPS. Like it's just so janky to me. Where when I when I kick on performance mode, it's just it's just buttery smooth. That's what I like. So so that's really my only nit with the game. It not having the options. Um, I do think that it's uh, you know it's it's great to hear the previews are, have been very positive about this game. Um, it sounds like it's going to be one of the the better looking games this generation from what I've read from some of the previews. But I think unfortunately, and this is Microsoft's own doing or Xbox's own doing, is that the conversation around this game is going to be like, when's it going to come to the PlayStation Five? And maybe it will. Maybe maybe it will. Maybe it won't. Um, I'm I'm leaning to believe that it probably will be eventually coming to PlayStation Five. Especially if this game doesn't sell well. Um, but, but we, we, yeah. I mean, no, I should I should say that. I, I mean, yeah. I, it, I mean, again, despite my critical problems with Starfield, Starfield was in a genre. I mean, it was in the RPG genre, right? Which you know, as I posted in the clips that I put on Twitter today, is is you know, the you know one of the if not the most popular genre across multiple geographic regions right around the world. Um, and so, you know, it, it goes to PC and it sells well. Uh, this is not an RPG. I, you know, this, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to sell well on Xbox because it's going into Game Pass um, and because of this incredibly small install base. So I don't know, that would just, I would be really, I would be really surprising um, to see uh, the, the game chart NPD, right? The, the first month of release. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is, um, and this is, we I know we had this conversation earlier, but one of the things when I look at games too, and I kind of think about the, especially with like an exclusive game, right, coming from a first party studio, I have to think uh, what, and I know you think about you, you I think you you look at this uh, in the same way too, like what's going to be the impact of this release to the business to the perception of the brand. And, you know, I don't know if this game is necessarily going to move the needle for Xbox or have any real impact for the brand. You know, maybe drive, I, think, and I, I know you said this earlier, like it, it may, maybe it doesn't drive to uh, Game Pass subscriptions or sell consoles. Because I think that's, that's a thing that's been missing for them. I see a lot of people saying, oh, well, they need to change their strategy and they need to do things differently. And for me, I always go back to with it, the, the the obvious thing for me to, for them to do is is to make great great games, to make games that really move the needle for the for the industry for the market, for their platform for their brand. Well, and I mean that that, that brings up a good point, right? And and maybe something that that we've gotten a little incorrect in in the way we've nuanced that message, right? It's not just make great games. It's you you have to make. Well, I I don't think we've gotten it wrong. I think we've said it. I think maybe we just haven't said it you know, in the same sentence, because what we've talked about is for instance, Pentiment may be a great game. Grounded may be a great game, but people aren't buying Xboxes for Pentiment and Grounded. Right. And so this is kind of another thing that's in that vein, um, slightly differentiated from those, I would say by the quality of the visuals, but this is yet another game that yes, very well. The game will probably be great. And, and the th thing I was going to say about 4k 30, that's differentiated for this in Starfield is, I don't think in terms of reviewers, like 4K30 isn't going to make any difference, right? In, in people's critical review of this game, in my opinion. Um, whereas uh, on Starfield, when you right when you when you have kind of a, a, a low performing game, and then you combine that with you know loading screens, some visuals that aren't great, you know NPCs that aren't particularly you know you know don't don't really come off with great performances. You know, and then you're looking at the thing in, in, in 4K30 and, you know, the, the space combat, you know, it doesn't have the same fidelities. I mean, so so there I think that 4K30 got caught up in a mix of other 
cons and negatives, right, that impacted how that game was kind of received. Um, and in particular, how it was received on PC, right, looking at the Steam user community reviews. Um, but I, like, I, I don't think Hellblade's going to suffer from that. But, 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 it, but it still bears instance, right, that it's, you can't just make great games. You need to make great games as well as make great games that have wide consumer appeal to the wider market, not just niche. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm glad you fleshed that out a bit. Cause I think p- people often get when, when they hear it say that, they're like, Oh, well, what about Pediman? What about, you know, uh, grounded, you know, or I don't know if grounded, I don't know. I forget what the reviews were for grounded, but Pediman, let's just use Pediman, which received decent reviews. What about Pediman? What about, um, Tim Schafer, psychonauts Two? What about that game? Those are good games. Well, yeah, and they are great games. They're good games. But well, games this is, that, that really move the needle for the platform, for the industry. Because this, this is America, and I <laughs> fell in love with Ford because yeah. of the Mustang. Yeah. I didn't fall in love with Ford for the Escort or the Focus. Oh, <laughs> right? man, you brought up the Ford Escort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Remember the Ford Escort GT? Yeah. Look, I mean, in the, in the part of me that is a that is a fan of rally racing, I love the I love the Ford Escort. You know, it's a great rally car, right? But as far as a passenger vehicle and the thing that I'm going to go actually buy myself, you know, that's that's not why you fall in love with Ford. My, and my point of that analogy is, you know, it's you know the the twelve teraflop monster, you know that that or thing that eats monsters for breakfast, like that's not, you know, grounded in pentiment or why you buy that console. Yeah, you know, no, now, I, I don't disagree. Now, you definitely, you probably are an argument that you need the graphical power of, of an Xbox to make a cinematic experience like Hellblade 2, which is what everybody's now calling it, which is very hypocritical to me because, you know, the, the, the people that run around on podcasts saying that PlayStation dudes, you know, play movies and then tear the notion of a cinematic experience apart. But now suddenly cinematic experiences are OK in order to justify 4K 30, but whatever. Um, but you know, but you probably do need the power of of that console in order to render visuals of the type that they're trying to achieve with Hellblade to to achieve that cinematic experience. So, you know, I I, I do give a nod in that direction. Um, but like I said, the I think the I think the business case and the profitability case, the commerciality case, right of this is that it's it's niche. It only it's only going to appeal to so many people, and at the end of the day, that number of people doesn't result in you know, a large number of increased Game Pass subscriptions or um, our console sold when you when you take into the notion of, you know, the the old the old targets of, you know, in excess of a hundred million Game Pass subscribers by twenty twenty seven or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. And again, and that's a thing. I mean that's that's a thing that they've needed. They needed that um they need something to really move the needle. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. but uh, but by that same token, right? Yeah. In in terms of the context of Hellblade, Hellblade Two was never that, and that's my point. No, no, right? it's not. no. Hellblade, no, no. Hellblade Two was never that. From the time they acquired Ninja Theory, Hellblade Two was never going to be that. And so, you know, by the same token, I, I've I've said, you know, I've always I've often commented and criticized a little bit, you know, the the amount of weight that get that gets put on even even Halo, you know, to a certain extent. But the weight that gets put on these games, you know, to achieve things that they can never achieve. You know, like calling Starfield Game of the Generation before it even came out, when nobody really had an idea what they were getting. Um, you I know, was, I just I, I, I was guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, yeah, I, I just, mean, and I was just basing that off of Bethesda's pedigree. What what well, I wasn't what I wasn't expecting is is a game that, in my opinion, is a bit archaic in its design and delivery. Well, what I will definitely say is, you know, and this is the frustrating thing, you know, like I said, I, I've I've never called for Phil Spencer's ouster, but I do are, are still worry. Now? No, I but I, I I do I do worry I do wonder why Aaron Greenberg still has a job, you know, because because part of the part of the mea culpa tour was Spencer saying, hey, we need to do a better job of accurately portraying to our gamers, you know, the game that they're going to be playing and not misrepresenting it. Um, I'm like, okay, but I never saw a loading screen in in the dozens of hours of coverage that there was for Starfield in the year and a half leading up to its eventual release. I ne- I don't remember ever seeing a loading screen. I definitely don't ever remember seeing three or four loading screens in a row. 
I never saw Sarah being left behind as I transitioned from that loading screen into the next room. I never saw the NPC, you know, bopping out of nowhere, you know, or me being me showing up at my mission objective, seeing nowhere, seeing my companion nowhere in sight, and then them, them just bopping into the room out of nowhere. You know what I mean? So don't I don't really feel like Starfield was really presented to us in the way that you know that that it actually came off and that, and that was part of the problem part of the messaging um I'm, you know and, and and greenberg is out here yet again right <laughs> putting pressure on hellblade 2 right to be something that i mean clearly we can kind of see the writing on the wall now that 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 it's not and it shouldn't have that pressure and, it, and i said the same thing about redfall you know i mean I, I, as frustrated as i am by the way redfall went down and and how that train wreck could be allowed to happen you know, I, mean, I mentioned to you one of the one of the briefs that I've attended is this operation was an operational risk management brief about the Titanic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and yeah. the in, in the literal multiple dozens of things that went wrong. Where if you go back as mm -hmm. early as I'd say maybe forty eight to seventy two hours in that timeline, I mean, just not just talking about the raw design of the ship that was problematic, but like specific events, like forty eight hours pr you know prior to that ship hitting the iceberg. That if you had changed any one of those events it probably wouldn't have hit the iceberg like that, that type of calamity of, you know, lemony snicket or, or, you know, unfortunate events. Like I can't understand how that was allowed to happen, but as angry as I am about that, I still go back and I say, Arkane Austin should have never been put in that situation. Arkane Austin should have never had that pressure upon their shoulders. That, that studio and that game should have never been the poster child that Xbox was bandying about from the beginning of the year as being like this big marquee right superhero release that was representative of like the value you signed up for for game pass that was representative of why you bought the console that was just that was just unfair to them yeah let me uh no i i, I yeah i don't disagree with you uh hamp um let me grab the super chat from uh war one of the two dollar super chat says no one game can fix xbox they need consistency i don't i don't disagree with that uh war one I think it's not just one game. I think it needs to be a consistent string of games that really move the needle for the platform, for the industry, for the market. That really, you know, where a game that's the zeitgeist that's recognized not just by. It's funny. I mentioned this on Crossfire Logic. A lot of people tend to obsess and focus on Jeff Keeley or the Keeleys, as I call them, the Game Awards show, and we will often hear. Xbox centric podcasters say, Oh, it's media bias. It's the Xbox tax. And yet they're not paying attention to what's happening at GDC or the Dice Awards. And yet we see at those award shows that Sony and Nintendo, and not just them, I mean, there are other third party publishers that release games that were, that were voted for, nominated, voted for, um, awarded um, um, in their respective categories. But but we see, like, uh, Spider-Man is an example. It, it, what I forget how many awards it won at GDC, but it pretty much cleaned house at GDC. Uh, and that's an award show by the industry peers, by the studios at Microsoft, their, their peers in the industry that are awarding these games, these awards at the Games Developer Conference or, or the GDC Awards. Uh, and DICE uh, being another example of that. And, and so I think that kind of recognition by industry peers, not just by journalists, by industry peers. I think it's important for the brand because I feel like the the brand's kind of in this weird place right now. Logically, I this this pivot of putting four games, um, and it's actually more than four. It's actually five because they put, um, uh, what's the other game that came out? They they own it. Um, it wasn't announced at the business update. Is it Dust Till Dawn? I forget. Oh, it's Dust Falls. Thank you, Warwana. I said Dust Till Dawn. Uh, yeah, it's as, as Dust Falls. That was the other one that that. It's a great. It's a great movie, by the way. Yeah, it is actually a good movie. <laughs> um, Sama, Sama Hayek's my Kryptonite. Yes, yes, yes. That was a, actually that. Uh, God, who's the director of that? That's uh, Robert Rodriguez. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, yep. So uh, Quentin Tarantino's in that. If I. And I forget who else is in it. But, yeah, uh, Quentin Tarantino, um, George Clooney. Uh, that's right, George Clooney. Yeah. Cheech. I can't. I can never get straight who which one is Cheech. Cheech was in Cheech, there. Cheech, Cheech Marin. Marin. Yeah, Cheech Marin was there. Yeah. 
Not Tommy yeah. Chong, even though they will be. Uh, Har- yeah, no, it's funny they're going to be in Call of Duty, but <laughs> yeah, Harvey Keitel, yeah, Harvey Juliet Keitel Lewis, is. yep, yeah. So um, yeah, the, <laughs> someone said that Selma a uh, Hayek snake scene. Yes, I remember that uh, very well. And she looks great, by the way. She's like fifty something years old. She looks great still. Um, oh, geez, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying, Logic? Because I'm not thinking about uh, Selma. Um, ah, shit. Oh, uh, yeah, so they so that was the fifth game. And so I feel like the brand's in this weird place because and I said this earlier, like now the conversation is anytime a, a an exclusive game comes out, now the conversation is will this game be ported to the PlayStation? We know it's we know it's gonna be on PC day and date, but at some point will it make it to the PlayStation? Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I wanna I, I wanna caveat that piece, right? I mean in in you know, in another mutual of mine on um on, on Twitter has mentioned that same thing, like that, you know, well now, now every time a game comes out, like this is always going to be the question instead of really focusing on like, is it a good game? Right. And I, and I agree with that. I mean, the, the reality in terms of market impact is those are only questions. Like if you've bought an Xbox or you've bought a PlayStation five for the most part, you've made your choice. So that being a question doesn't really impact you outside of, you know, cloud chasing. If you're a new buyer though, or if you're a new gamer coming into the market, or you're one of these people who buys consoles late in the generation because you don't feel like the games are there to really justify the upgrade, now you've got a choice to make, right? Now, now you're going, well, and again, this is this is the problem I have with the people who have flip flopped, who were like, you know, you know or, or the people who said, well, no, nobody that you know, nobody feels bad about their choice they made about buying an Xbox now that games are going to other platforms. And again, I go back to if if you sold me a piece of hardware and told me I was going to have access to one third of the console content, and then three years later you tell me, well, actually, if you'd bought the other console, you'd actually have access to two thirds of the console content. That changes that math, and some people are going to be bothered by that. Mm-hmm. And new, that is the that is the that is the math the new buyers will be doing. They'll be saying, "Do I buy a PlayStation Five because it's going to wind up getting all the Xbox games anyway, or maybe the most important Xbox games are the ones that I will actually care about, or at least again, so much of what a consumer wants is a matter of choice, and so." you're presenting again the the problem where a PlayStation owner says, okay, but but then at least I'm going to be on the other platform and have a choice about whether or not I want to buy those Xbox games or not. You know, versus making, you know, go back three years ago if I'd made the choice that, that, that wouldn't have been an, an option. So on top of all that, <laughs> you then have the now further convoluted rumor of what Xbox is going to do next, where you say, well, if I pick the PlayStation 5, I'm going to have access to two thirds of the console content for this generation, right? But next generation, I may need to go Xbox because maybe I'll have access to even more content on the Xbox, given what Phil Spencer kind of is hinting at notions of what his strategy might be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, um, you know, and that, 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 the point that you made about the consumer now looking at the Xbox and thinking to themselves, well, do I get the Xbox if, if all their games are going to coming or, or many of their games are going to be coming to the PlayStation console. And on top of that, I'm getting the PlayStation exclusives that I know aren't going to the Xbox console or aren't going to be day and date on PC yet. I say yet because I you never speak in absolutes, but I don't, I don't think that's happening right now um, or anytime soon. But, um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I mean that, that, you know, kind of speaks to what some people have brought up when, you know, after the the business updates, is potential devalue the, the devaluation of the brand, because now you don't necessarily need an Xbox, especially if more games start coming to their rival platforms like the Nintendo Switch and and PlayStation Five. So it's just it's just again it, to me it's just interesting. It's really interesting where the brand is right now. I I you know they're just to me they're in this weird place because they're not a traditional they're not anymore i think a traditional console they have really torn down those walls those barriers of entry to the xbox ecosystem and they're now putting their first party games on playstation and nintendo switch it's just it's just really weird i just never thought that 
that would happen ever. And now it has. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out for them. If it's something they look back at and regret, or maybe, or, or, or if it changes how or what consumers demand from, from platforms, you know, I, I don't think that's going to be the case, but, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, let's see here. Logic, I want to pull up. I know we didn't have this as an official topic, but I want to talk about Matt Piscatella's tweet today because you and I talked about this earlier. The U.S. video game, uh, his tweet, the U.S. video game market peaked in 2008. Uh, and, he sh- and he says, a share of console purchases is increasingly swinging to older folks. Zoomers care less about console than pri- than prior gens and and alphans may never care every video game company is thinking about expansion beyond the console they have to and he shows this chart it shows the peak in 2008 so i you know you and i've gone back and forth about this like i <laughs> i understand this uh, this argument about gen z but but then i go back to gen z is, is 27 years old uh, it goes up to age 27 i did pull a, a study or a survey that was conducted where it said Gen Z will 80% of Gen Z gamers will play games on gaming consoles. Uh, and those are going to be the Gen Z, I would imagine, gamers that are a little bit older. But uh, is Matt missing something here? Like, because you and I have talked a lot about this where it's like, okay, like our kids are Gen Z. Um, I think our kids are Gen Z. Maybe yours are. Mine might be. I'd have to look. But anyhow, so and look, and, and and I'm not saying Matt's wrong. Um, Matt probably has data that we, it, you know, other uh, data points he's looking at that maybe we're not aware of. Um, but I I just find it interesting that perhaps it's a foregone conclusion. You know, and maybe it's maybe it's me. Maybe it's maybe it's because I'm older, Hamp, and I'm I'm holding on to the reins. I'm holding on to the, this idea of consoles will always be here. I don't think gaming consoles will always necessarily be here. I think that I could see an evolution of that. Um, I mean, well, Brad, let me let me yeah. let me ask you. Um, do we still have radio stations? We do. Yeah. Um, you know the the film we, industry. We still have ovens. Yeah. Yeah, we still build houses with ovens and stoves, even though, you know, my generation grew up with microwaves. Um, you know, we, you know, the movie industry was at 56.8 billion in 2005. They've grown to 92.9 billion. Um, I'm not sure if I'm only looking at U.S. data. Uh, oh, yes, this is U.S. data. So, so in the U.S., the movie industry went from 56.8 billion in 2005 to 92.9 billion in 2022. Uh, that includes a peak in 2007 to where they then cratered in 2009, and then dug themselves back out of that hole, plateaued from 2018 to 2019 obviously lost a little bit during the pandemic years. Um, they've actually b- experienced explosive growth from 2020 to 2022, recovering about $21 billion uh, in, in revenue over those two years. Um, all of this was during the time of, uh, you know, wireless surround sound, Sono speakers, flat screen TVs, the advent of 4K televisions, us moving from floor model, rear projection TVs, right, to LCDs, OLEDs, QLEDs, streaming services in the home. You can easily sit in your basement in your man cave and get a near movie-like experience in your home. And yet, people still go to the movies. And yet, Gen Z... is going to the movies. So so what I just don't understand is this notion that this 50-year industry, which is the youngest of the media industries, is, is suddenly going to just eradicate and eliminate 
it, the second largest earning segment, right, based on a generational delta, because those kids have access to new technologies. We have talked about killing the radio station a half dozen times over, at least since its inception in the early 1900s. Cassettes, we're, we're going to kill the radio industry and, and records. CDs, we're going to kill the radio industry. Streaming services, we're going to kill the radio industry. And yet in this country, we still have, I think, 15,000 radio stations. FM was going to kill the AM radio station. We still broadcast on AM radio. We have said the same thing about television and movies through beta, VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, Blu-ray 4K UHD, streaming services. Technological innovations do not necessarily result in the, in the death or elimination of large earning segments of media consumption, right? When there, when there aren't that many choices, somebody mentioned, you know, do, do people still buy MP3 players? Um, no, but, but again, MP3 players were one method of consumption of music um, amongst many. And, and really MP3 players were also kind of a, kind of part of like, like Uber nerds. I don't know that MP3 players, other than the iPod, I don't know that MP3 players ever really broke out to normals. You know, but consoles, right, wrong, or indifferent, um, are largely being consumed by a lot of normals now. People who are not, I am sorry to say, maybe people get in, people who are not particularly technically savvy. You see that represented on Twitter and, yeah. and on podcasts. Yeah, quite a bit, actually, yeah. Or <laughs> you don't, know. Don't, don't understand the, or don't have any understanding of the history of video games. Yeah, they're a very, the they are a very, yeah. they're a very commonplace appliance level type of electronic. I've refer, often referred to them as a, as a glorified ASIC and application specific integrated chip. You know, and now, in fact, I was just having this conversation with somebody, and now with the incorporation of apps and the DVD player and the Blu-ray player, they're much more so a kind of a common generic living room appliance than, than they were, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s, where, again, they were kind of a thing that was the provenance of Uber nerds. Yeah. Well, so, I, yeah. So, so I think one of the things is, and I think one of the things that gets left out of this conversation is, I think sometimes people forget and maybe the rush to gush and the rush to say, you know, Xbox is doing the right thing. We forget that there have been innovations in the console industry that have, that have led to growth of the industry and led to spikes right from, from kind of where they were previously plateauing that happened when the PlayStation two was introduced and it incorporated the DVD drive. You had a lot of people who were not gamers buying PlayStation two. You had PlayStation when it came onto the scene, um, making a lot of titles and content that were, a lot more mainstream, uh, greater integration of kind of Western views of game design, which I think led to greater uptake in the United States. But again, you, you, as we exited kind of out of that generation where it had been all Nintendo, all Sega, you, you introduced a console that I think had a lot more wide mass appeal that was doubled down on with the PlayStation two. You had the Nintendo Wii come along that caused a spike and caused growth, brought a lot of new gamers into the fold. And then, as I mentioned, when the console started integrating apps, you started getting to a place where now I don't, I don't need, you know, in, in this era of smart devices where you have apps on televisions, apps on Blu-ray players, apps on DVD players, the console for a lot of people becomes that common generic centric living room component where they don't need a lot of the other stuff. So, so there are things that can happen in the console space and it doesn't necessarily, we, we don't necessarily need to have a conversation that ascribes all notion of innovation to every other electronic device other than the console. I think that's that, that historically is, is not in sync with what has actually transpired over the history of the industry. The other thing too is um, our kids are, are, are subject to, to our will, <laughs> you know, like they game on what we what we allow them to game on or what we give them to game on like you know like my right. kids like i i don't like i i don't sit there cuz i see a lot of people say oh well my kids primarily game on uh mobile devices so therefore that's going to be the future well i okay my my household that's different so is is my household an outlier like my 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 oldest who's a gen zer is playing on pc so if I use that logic, then I would imagine that he's going to be a PC player. 
or that my kids are going to play on console because my kids primarily, the younger kids primarily are gaming on gaming consoles right now. Well, well the other thing is we, we allow them access to those devices because those in a lot of cases, those devices are cheap. They're throwaway. We don't really care about them getting broken. They, a lot of a lot of kids play on tablets because a lot of kids have the Amazon Fire tablet, that kid's tablet that you buy that comes with a big cushion around it that has a two-year guarantee where if they break it, you just send it in to Amazon and get a new one, which I've taken advantage of on more than one occasion. <laughs> or because you spent $1,000, $1,100, $1,200, $1,500 on a phone, you only keep it for two years, and you'll be doggone if after two years when you upgrade your phone, right, you're, 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 just, you're not going to gain any additional return on investment of that. So many phones are flowed down to children and recycled. Right, they, they, they are playing on those devices so they have access to it. What you don't do, in most cases, is you don't generally give your kids free run of the $500 console or the $1,500 PC until they're older and they start buying things like that on their own. But again, you know, I go back to, you know, our kids, our, our parents put things in our hands that were inexpensive throwaway devices that we weren't wor- that they weren't worried about getting broken. Right, those Coleco Mattel football games, like the the Mattel Dungeons and Dragons uh, and football game. Um, but also, when we talk about other forms of entertainment, right? We you hit you had a Walkman, right? But we don't still use those devices today. You had well, things that you, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and and that's a great point because this this idea of playing games on outside of consoles has existed for thirty years. I mean. I mean, outside of the the little Mattel, you know, the football game that you're talking about, you know, with the the like had like the red, um, I don't know what they're called, not the little red, LED. red red LED blips, yeah, yeah, the little red blips. Um, we had we had the Nintendo Game Boy. We had we had one to one console experiences with the TurboGrafx sixteen. Um, I forget what their handheld was called. Well, well, that's that's the thing, right? We're, again, what people tend to forget. Remember, the market was literally flooded with handheld devices. Yeah, like that every, we had ample access to. There was a point where we had access to the links, the Game yeah. Gear, right? I think I guess the N Gauge came a little later, and the Game Boy. You had multiple choices of handheld consoles that you could buy, that you could be given access to. I'm looking at the Turbo Graphic 16 one. That was the uh, somebody said it was the Turbo Express. Is that what it's called? Oh, I'm gonna have to look this up now. Turbo Express. Um. Yeah, Turbo Express. Here you go. The the eight bit handheld game console by NEC. Yep, that was it. We had the PlayStation yeah. Portable, and you could you could actually use the same um, disc, or whatever it was. I it wasn't a disc. It was like a what the hell was it? I guess it was kind of like a disc. It, the Turbo Graphics sixteen had like a cartridge type thing. Um, it wasn't disc. It was like this like little cartridge that you would put into the the console, and you could put into the Turbo Express. But we had those. We've had, like I say, we've we've had these technologies, the ability to play games on the go, and many and and, and younger and a younger group and younger generation of gamers grew up on that too, and we didn't see them com- completely abandon console gaming, you know, um, because we always talk about this logic, like once they start getting their own disposable income, like once you start getting your own disposable income, I feel like that that changes your behavior as a consumer. I know it did for me. I started looking at consumer products differently. I started thinking to myself, I started making X amount of dollars. And I thought to myself, geez, I actually, I'd, I'd actually like to have that television set. That's $2,000 now, you know, or that surround sound system, you know? So, but I, I, but I don't disagree that, that perhaps the, the form factor of the console could change over time. Maybe it becomes more of like a uh, like a streaming device, like a Apple TV type box. Yeah, and I, and I think you know, I think so many times people are having this conversation, and you know, it's it's always binary, right? It's oh, this this is going to happen, and consoles are going to go away. Um, again, I, I, I can turn the consoles are nowhere near going away. Even Matt Piscatella, and this is the kind of thing that frustrates me, you know, Matt Piscatella has even walked back, you know, what he said, he's like, oh, okay, well, we're really not talking about like a, like a big groundswell change until like 2040, 
right? And again, he still ascribes that to you know the a, a, a generational causality. But I mean, these these things and these manners of consumption have existed for a very long time. Smartphones have been around since two thousand seven. Playing games on smartphones smartphones has been around since two thousand eight. You know, out once once Apple opened up the App Store or how, whatever the delay lag was between the iPhone actually coming out and the App Store actually opening. iPad was around in 2010. Android, Android tablets were already starting to show up without Google's Express authorization before the iPad launched. I had an Arco Seven tablet which ran Android that you could play games on. These things have been around for a very long time. They've been around for 14 years. You know, 17 years. Um, and again, I go back to the gaming industry is relatively a 50 year old industry. And you look at the other entertainment mediums, they've been around for hundreds of years and they still haven't eliminated some of the original means of consumption that, that, you know, came up when they were originally created. I mean, the movie theaters. Great. Right. Right. Those have been around forever. Right. And at a time and I, where you, where you could easily shut that down with the ability to stream. Absolutely. That is, that is still a thing. And, and, and I, Gen Z, like, they're going to the movies. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, you, you know, just as significantly, right, I, when I went through that data that I just went through, you go through the pandemic where literally people could not go to the movie theater. You know, I think what, what, were, the, what were the measures that were in place at a movie theater? Like you, like, you could still go to the movie theater, but people had to be separated, like a limited capacity. People had to be separated yeah, by... Separated. Blah, blah, blah. Like, it was just, like, look, people just stopped going to the movie theater. And despite that, in the recovery time since lockdown lifted to today, that industry has gained $21 billion in revenue. You know, so I just, I just think the fantasy that, you know, it's all going to go away. It's all going to come to a screeching halt. I just, I just don't think that that's, you know, you know where we are. No, I don't, I don't disagree. Hap. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not saying that, that consoles will never go away or that maybe Gen Z decides no, it's not for us. I, I just, I, I think it's a bit more, again, I think the conversation is a bit more nuanced than what people are giving it, as I always say now. You know, yeah, and, 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 and I mean, and part of the thing that gets left out of the conversation, again, I think a lot of people are touting this notion of mobile, but they're the people who haven't actually been following the mobile industry. But I mean, I was, a, I was a mobile technology reviewer, you know, for eight years. Like in, in that time, we've seen tablets rise and we've seen tablets go, right? I had the Motorola Zoom. I had, you know, every major Android tablet that had been released. And we've, we've apogeed in that market to where we've seen Google stop making tablets. Google stopped making tablets. Now they've come back with kind of a low cost, a low cost entry. But really the only Android premium tablet that's being made is being made by Samsung. We've seen an erosion of, I think, I think the thing, I think the data that I was looking at, the industry data that I was looking at was like hundreds of cell phone manufacturers have come and gone. You know, there is no more HTC, ZTE, and, uh, and Asus have really, like, you know, significantly backed off what they've made available in America. We're now in a market where, you know, Apple and Samsung control like 75% of the market. Mm-hmm. So we're just we're just not in a place where there's this notion that you you know we're about to see you know something explosive happen you know across mobile you know we've we've been there already and it didn't happen then yeah but not saying I, it may, maybe we'll never come back but like that's yeah. just not where we are yeah I wonder by the way I wonder if Matt's listening to the show because <laughs> uh, he tweeted something out eight minutes ago no consoles aren't dying of course they aren't they they will be a thing for as long as people want to buy them we've said this on this show. As long as the consumer demand is still there, they're not going anywhere, you know, and, and Gen Z could very much still buy consoles. It's not a foregone conclusion that they won't. Um, he says, but it's a mature market, which we talked about on this show. Growth has to come from other supplemental areas, which we talked about on this show. Uh, it's fine, but there are reasons why everyone is trying to expand their markets. We've talked about that on this show, too. Uh, if consoles ever do go away, it will be because they've evolved or new or uh, they because they've evolved, which you talked about, uh, Lodge, about a convergence of devices, right? Um, yeah. That they've evolved and new or refreshed business models have been mass adopted, which you've talked about on this show. Again, it's fine. Demand for gaming hasn't slowed at all. It's just changing as it has forever, which you've talked about on this show. Like you said, like it, it, this is 
this is where I get a bit frustrated with content creators uh, logic, and I shared I shared this with you today earlier that like you and I've talked about the importance of understanding history, you know, um, and a lot of the content creators, um, not all, but 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 quite a few, and I'm going to pick on the Xbox ones because they, they they tend to be the the biggest offenders of this. Don't understand. Don't understand the history of gaming or the fact that gaming has always been in a constant state of flux. It's always changing. And it has been for the last, what, 30, 40 years? I've, I've been gaming for 42 years now. And it's changed ever since since the time I can remember playing Space Invaders. The egg industry has changed. I actually went through the actual crash of the game industry. I saw someone tweet today that he thought the industry was going to crash. And I'm like, no, sir, it's not crashing. That's just not happening right now. <laughs> um, but, but again, I think, I think Matt's listening to us. And if you are Matt, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Got to get you back on the show. It's been six years. I think Matt, since we've five or six years since we've had you on BRAP. It's a long time, very long time. Um, yeah. So do you, uh, Logic, any other thoughts on what Matt just tweeted? I mean, I know we, we've all pretty much have, have, have said what he just said here in this tweet. Yeah, and I, and I think that's part of the crux of it, right, is yeah. Matt, I think, my, my, my personal opinion, because we've talked about this too, and we've talked about like the things Matt's tweeting and the things he's saying, and I, do, and I, and I, 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 I firmly believe that Matt's intentions are altruistic and comes from a place where he cares about the industry and he doesn't want to see you know, the market crash of 1983 and he, but he also doesn't want to see, you know, developers, you know, kind of forced into, you know, Nike sweatshops, right. And, and, and crunched, you know, to oblivion to keep up with this maddening pace that, that definitely at times seems like it's going to go thermonuclear, right. I totally understand that. Um, but, but I think like the, like the, the specific nuance and kind of laser targeting that the message he's trying to make. I, I don't think that Twitter provides the best framework to get that across. But then I think as an even worse problem is that so much of what he says gets weaponized, right? To, to be a corroborative point or to be, you know, a justification point for a narrative that somebody else is trying to put across in I think that's where you know a lot of our comments come from, where we're like, "Hold on, time out, pump the brakes." You know, let's not let's not go off to the races, right, with this singular soundbite. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's the problem. A lot of people go off to the races; they don't give the conversation the nuance that it deserves because it isn't it isn't just a like I think you said this earlier. Like a lot of people make this a binary conversation, and it's not. Um. But yeah, it, it's, I don't just like Twitter's probably, you're right. Like Twitter's probably not the place to have that conversation either. I don't disagree with you, Logic. Because you're right, people do weaponize it, unfortunately. Uh, I want to get Super Chat here from Street Shadow with the $20 Super Chat. Thank you, Street Shadow. I played on console and PC, but I work all day on computers. To then turn a game that to then turn a game there too is not appealing. I'm in my 30s, married with a kid, playing on the couch, and my family is only done well on console. Thank you for that super chat, sir. Yeah, you know it's funny. I, I hear that argument from people quite. Um, that's one thing that comes up with with PC gaming. I hear people say, oh, "I'm on my computer all day. I don't want to. I don't want a PC game. You know, I'm already sitting at my desk all day. I don't want to do that anymore." I get that. But Street Shadow, that's why, sir, you should hook up your PC to your TV, which I've done. But I know not everyone is able to do that either. So, <laughs> um, I also love the TV that um, that I have to play PC gaming on the uh, C C one OLED, great TV. Um, all right, Logic, I want to move on to um, to Phil Spencer's Xbox strategy here. Because, you know, something that uh, was brought up on Crossfire last night, Phil Spencer talking about reaching to these these 2 billion gamers, the uh, always thinking about how can we grow the business? How can we get more games in the hands of consumers? Hey, Brad, I'm sorry, yeah. before you get to it, did you get Lord Metroid's Super Chat? Oh, you know what? I did not. Thank you. I actually missed that. Thank you. 
Uh, sorry about that, Lord Metroid. Uh, Lord Metroid with a $2 super chat. Thank you, sir. Again, apologies. I missed that super chat. Nintendo laughs at this no hardware nonsense. Yeah, I mean, they, they do. Nintendo being the most archaic of all the big three are doing very well, I might add. You know, you notice how, like, when, when people, and this is why I know that the conversation tends to be disingenuous, and it's sometimes more about proving one company's strategy be, being better than the other. They never rope Nintendo into the conversation. You notice that, right, Logic? Yeah, because because God forbid we have to cover the timeline of where it felt like Nintendo almost tanked their business by coming out with the Wii U, dug their heels in and refused, refused to do anything more significant in terms of seeking growth, in quotation marks, on mobile, other than farm their IP out to a couple of shops and allow them to do some endless runners. And despite getting kind of good traction on uh i think they put out two fire emblem games and the one that was free to way, play that that, that, that Mar- super mario one's actually a fun game on the f- on, on on mobile <laughs> yeah yeah i've actually yeah. Been, and I, i've actually played it uh, i was playing it yesterday as a matter of fact <laughs> and, I, and i think they i think they put out two fire emblem games and one was free to play and one was paid and the paid one was actually the one that was more successful i believe that's correct but when all of these things were going on, and I will probably I was probably there too, saying, ah, Nintendo should go mobile. Nintendo should do more with mobile, right? And they dug their heels in and refused to do so. And, and then they came out with the lightning in the bottle that was the Nintendo Switch, recovered from all that, and is one of the most successful gaming companies. Now, you know, I, I often talk about how through a certain point of the history of the gaming industry, when you look back at it, it was very much like a Formula One race. Number one, each generation typically got off to a big lead and they were just gone, right? And you didn't watch them race. They were just putting down lap times because there was nobody else near them. And the, and the race was typically between number two and number three. But in this generation, you know, n- number one and number two have kind of outpaced and are off by themselves. But they're also r- like running on like two different sides of a split track. Like they split the industry up. They're doing their own thing. They've, they've put those demographics, those pieces of the addressable mark out in a, in a stratification and put them in a chokehold, right? But, but where Nintendo is, so you kind of look at where PlayStation is and you kind of go, yeah, well, you know, well, of course, you know, they came from behind, they caught Xbox 360 at the end of generation seven, you know, with the PlayStation three, they got off to a huge lead, you know, with generation eight and just kind of smothered Xbox. And of course they would be where they are now here in generation nine. But Nintendo is a story of failure and adversity and recovery. And you kind of wouldn't necessarily expect them to be. But, you know, but but to serve our narrative, of course, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about the opportunity Nintendo had had to go hardcore mobile to correct its error and chose not to do so. And actually tripled down on console. Right. Actually, actually ate their mobile, their handheld business. Well, that's what they did. They cannibalized (laughs) their handheld business and basically combined the two the two businesses together. But but you're right, like logic. But there were, I mean, I was one of those people, though. By the way, that back in the Nintendo Wii, like with the Wii U, was like, look, Nintendo should just go third party, right? Like we, like right. it, it, it wasn't just me. I mean, that was kind of a conversation that was happening in the forums at the time before I was on gaming Twitter. And some of us were like, they should just go third party, like put their games on on PlayStation, on Xbox. Right. They'll right. sell a lot, you know. And they said, hell no, we're not doing that. And now look where they are now. You know, leading, they're basically have sold, I forget how many um, Nintendo Switches. I think it's north of like 130 million. Yeah. I mean, it's arguably one of the most successful consoles. I mean, they they have a game that sold, what, 60 million units in in Mario Kart 8? Is it 60 million? I got to go back. I always forget the number. It's a lot. Uh, Lord Metro said they sold 140 million. You say 130, uh, Logic? Yeah, I said north of 130. Okay, so yeah, he's saying 140. Yeah, uh, someone's saying uh, Animal Crossing's at 45 million. Yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, that's just they're literally setting records like every yeah. month. <laughs> with, oh, with yeah. A title. Yeah. Like, and they have so many titles that came out six years ago, two years ago, three years ago, that continue to chart NPD. Not just the monthly charts, but still are on them in annual sales every year. Yeah. I mean, the, the, they, they there is a a big demand for Nintendo games and products 
If you don't believe me, just look at the numbers. I th- this is this is the point that uh, the part that drives me crazy too. It's like guys, like when we talk about Xbox, everyone's like, "Oh, you guys just hate Xbox." No, we're we're talking about the what the the um what's happening with Xbox in the marketplace right now, based on you know the 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 data points we have, you know the the sales numbers, their forecast. And, and I and I, lo- yeah. and I love Xbox, America. Yeah, no, right? I, I, I want well, Xbox. I, I want Xbox to be great again. I want them to be competitive because I don't want. I don't want Sony to start telling me again that I need to get a second job. That's right. Exactly. Competition's good. I mean, this is so. So I get. I get like a little. I get frustrated because people are like you guys say no, no. It's not about Xbox. Hey guys, it's about talking. We're talking about the business, and the business is the business. And if you don't believe me, like we're we're talking about Nintendo. Compare and contrast Nintendo's hardware growth, which they're in the seventh year of the life cycle of the Nintendo Switch, and they're seeing seventeen percent year-over-year declines in hardware sales in Europe. Contrast that to to Xbox, which is seeing 47%, 47% decline year-over-year in hardware sales growth. So if you just look at those numbers objectively, right, just just take the fandom, the emotion out of it. What does that tell you? What What is the market telling you based on that? That there's less demand for Xbox hardware. It just is what it is. And that's what we're talking about. The other day, like, I lot of you said... He, it's an American product. You want it to succeed. Um, I want to see Xbox successful. I, I don't like the idea of them putting their games on other platforms because I, I feel like it does devalue the the the, the hardware. I, I want there to be a competitor in the marketplace that's going to give Sony a run for their money because less competition is not good for consumers. We don't, no one should want PlayStation to be the only high-end console brand. It's just not good for consumers. So, so Paul's Gaming Live says in the chat, has it helped Nintendo's revenue, who is, who is smaller than Apple in gaming, who make nothing? The market is telling me Tencent is making double everyone else without hardware. So, so I think my, my personal perspectives on those two comments are, um, first of all, Apple and Google are larger than a lot of people in gaming who also don't make hardware, right? Yeah. Simply off, based off nothing other than their 30% cut, right? And, and despite that, other than the time that Google you know, took their, their step into, um, into Stadia, neither one of those companies have looked at that revenue and said, oh, yeah, we need to invest more there. We need to make our own console. We need to do this. We need to do that. So I, I, I understand the question, right? But, but I, don't, I don't necessarily agree that the data point that Google and Apple are, are bigger. You know, I know you didn't say Google. I'm adding Google. That Google and Apple are bigger. You know, so you know, could, in, in the, and then the notion that you know has it helped their revenue? Nintendo is only a gaming company, and and they are a, as far as I can tell, and this is you know definitely some subjective kind of you know philosophy or or more my own perception. They are a gaming company at heart. I hear a lot, lot, lot more from Nintendo from the creator perspective, from the a developer led organization than I hear from a financier, a bean counter, right? A business type suit, right? I, I, most of the vector of the conversation that I hear from Nintendo is about games and the creative intent. I don't know that Nintendo is, you know, in comparison to Sony and Microsoft, who are mega corporations who have multiple lines of business, multiple value streams, who are much more tightly tethered to their investors, their board of directors. I have I have not yet heard in any earnings call Nintendo's concerns about growth or or the industry stagnating. I haven't heard that. So to. So, so Paul, you're you I mean, I get it. I understand it's a it's a natural question. I'm not questioning your intent. You know, has it has it helped them? Has it helped them grow? I don't think that those are you remember, every company has their own KPIs and OKRs and business intent. And we've talked about on this show how yeah, we very, have, yeah. very, very many oftentimes, right? A company, whether it's a gaming company, just the natural state of business, sometimes that company's intent is not to corner market share. Sometimes that company's intent is to focus on that, owning you know, a specific I, demographic. I just realized, you, you may want to tell people what OKRs are. What the acronym means. I know what it means, but you might want to share that. Uh, with objective, objectives and key results. Yeah. 
for a business. So yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of 2024 speak for business metrics, right? So we mm-hmm. used to just say business metrics. Now we talk about KPIs and OKRs. So my point is Nintendo has objectives. Um, they have objectives that they need to achieve. Again, they were presented with a, with a plethora of adversity when they were with the Wii U. And, and they didn't go down these paths that are, to me, that people are suggesting that are reaches and very far off the beaten path in an effort to recover from that adversity when you would have thought that they would have had their backs to the wall in the most extreme case in a generation and that if they were going to go down those paths, they would have gone down them then. So I don't necessarily know that Nintendo is wrapped around the axle about having the largest revenue. They're definitely not wrapped around the axle about competing head-to-head with PlayStation and Xbox. They have said as much. That is why they pivoted their strategy. So... Sorry, I had a I had to delete somebody who was spamming. It looks like. <laughs> I think this. What, what is this five twelve design? By the way, I I just saw that. Sorry, I got distracted. I'm like, I don't know. I was about to ask him a question because I and I noticed he said something about Jason, but I was going to ask him. No, I, I think he yeah. was saying something about. I don't know what he. I he just didn't. He wasn't making sense. I I thought it was like a bot or something. Yeah. Anyhow. Um. Yeah. So so. You know, back to back to Phil Spencer's uh, Xbox strategy logic. Um, you know, this idea of reaching more gamers, right? These two billion gamers, and it was something that w- it was it was something that was brought up yesterday um, on Crossfire, and, and I started thinking about okay, well, who are these? Like, how how big is the gaming industry? Did a quick Google search, um, and I came up with about um, like three billion gamers worldwide, right? Actually, let me let me look at this again. I want to pull this search up. Yeah, and I and I think yeah. I think we should differentiate between those two things too. And I didn't listen to Crossfire last night. So, yeah. so in one context, there's a number of gamers who are in the market now, and I and I think I think that's the three billion number that we're talking about, right? Because when we look at when we look at the one point five billion ish that are in Asia, the seven hundred fifteen million that are in Europe, the four hundred twenty million that are in Latin America the high 300 million that are in North America, right? And then add all those numbers. I think it comes to 3 billion. In the past, though, I also want to mention that, you know, Phil and Satya have talked about accessing the additional gamers in the market. So people beyond those 3 billion, the people who are on phones who are not gamers now. So I'm not sure just, you know, in the context, which of those two sets of gamers you you guys were talking about. We were talking about just the, the 3 billion overall. Like, um, so you're right. There's there's uh, 1.48 billion um, in Europe, 715 million. Actually, we we're talking about both because one of the one of the things that I mentioned is it's. I'm not saying that you're not going to get any gamers that are on mobile devices or phones specifically to try games, but those are also different types of games. Uh, and even then, I think there's there's only a finite group of people that you're probably going to be able to capture. Uh, again, not saying that you, you won't you won't capture any of them. Um, but I, I often think that, that that effect or that impact is exaggerated on Twitter or by content creators who think like, oh, there's there's like 20 million people out there just waiting to get video games. They just haven't had games delivered to them. I'm like, well, wait a minute, like they do have games. I mean, they're they I mean there are games there are games on their you know on their on the Google Play Store, on the Apple Play. I mean, they're there. They're there for people to play them, to access them. They're often free to play, but they're not accessing them. So um, but we're also talking about the other three billion too, uh, logic. So, uh, so there are about three point two billion gamers globally in twenty twenty three. This is what I pulled up. Uh, as you mentioned, logic, uh, Asia has the highest number of gamers, one point four eight billion, followed by Europe with seven hundred fifteen million. Um, and I forget it, it didn't actually list the, the numbers of the United States, but I think you said four hundred something million in Latin America, right? And I forget yes, how like four twenty. I think it's four twenty. And you know, like three hundred million uh, for. Uh, like the U.S. For right? North America. North America, yeah. okay. Uh, uh, let's see here. 55% of gamers are males in the United States. 45% of gamers gamers are female gamers in the U.S. too. So um, game developers, according to this, uh, consider the PC as their favorite gaming platform. Uh, 66%, 66% of gamers worldwide play video games for relaxation. So um, as of 2023, the game industry reached a revenue of $90 billion in the U.S. So, uh, And then 618 million gamers across the world our age below 18. So my point was this, like if Phil's talking about reaching gamers, you know, the 2 billion, cause he did mention like 2 billion or 3 billion. I forget the number. He yeah. Sorry. Just, yeah. 
sorry, but I do want to go back. So somebody asked me about the number given the total population. Yeah, so uh, yeah. sorry, I was quoting that from memory. Um, I, I have gone over this chart on multiple podcasts and stuff, but I'm not always looking. So it's 1.48 billion in Asia, 750 million in Europe, 420 in Latin America. The North American number is 285 million. Um, and then I don't I don't know what the MENA region is. I forget. So in in Sub-Saharan Africa is 1,444 million. Oceania is 32 million. Yeah. Uh, so so my point was I. And, and then bringing and then bringing more games to uh, gamers on different devices, and so we were talking about that. And the one thing that that I that I was thinking about was this. And this is what really stood out to me: the the one point four, the one point four eight billion gamers in in Asia. And I'm thinking, okay, Phil, what 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 strategies do you have in place to bring content that's going to appeal to those gamers? What inroads are you making in Asia? Those other territories you just mentioned outside of the Western Hemisphere, um, outside of Europe. That are that are going to appeal to those gamers that are going that are going to grow your business. I, I'm not seeing that. <laughs> I could be wrong, but I'm not seeing them do any uh, have any incubation projects, make try to make any inroads or partnerships with developers in those countries. We know that um, we know that Sony's doing that. Uh, Sony with the China the China Hero Project, um, Sony with the India Hero Project. Actually, uh, Shio Yoshida was in India for their version for their GDC. Uh, we know that Sony's um, working to, uh, or is actively engaging developers in Africa. Um, and each of those regions have different tastes. We talk about Japan. Japan, everyone's like, oh, look at, look at, you know, people often make light of, of PlayStation sales in Japan. Oh, look, in their home country, they came and sell PlayStation. But the reality is they don't understand the market that the uh, Japanese primarily game on mobile devices now. It's a different market. So... So that was that was kind of that that's the that's what I was thinking about that to reach those gamers in different in those different regions to expand that book of business you got to start making games that that appeal to those gamers and I'm not seeing them do that right now like I, I Halo Infinite is probably not going to appeal to people um, in in China um, or Japan or Hellblade Two is probably not going to appeal to those countries either you know. Um, like like they would here in the US. So so when he talks about these things, Hamp, and I'm looking at that number, I mean like I, I just don't see them and I could be wrong, but I don't see them executing or, or, or discussing any strategy to really reach those gamers, to draw those gamers into their ecosystem. It seems very it, just based on the content the games are working on. It seems to me more Western centric than anything else. But what are your thoughts about this logic? Well, I've been writing and podcasting about this extensively for about the past month. So I'm uh, no, no, no offense to the cast of Crossfire, but I'm, I'm glad you guys came to the realization last night. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> well, no, I mean, look, I, I, well, because I looked at that number, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, Phil said he wants to reach. You know these billions of gamers. He wants to bring more games. He wants to bring you know uh, games on more devices to to get people gaming. But then I'm thinking like more means outside of the United States, presumably. I would imagine uh, more means uh, globally. I would imagine. And then I'm looking at that Asian number. I'm like, well, they play games differently than we do. <laughs> so like, and I and I can't I can't see anything where I've seen Phil say, look. We, we're working on a. We have our own version of the China Hero, China Hero Project. We're trying to make inroads in in India, in Africa. I haven't seen that. So, yeah. So, so, so I posted a couple things today. Um, so, number one, on, on talking about games, I've I've done two segments across two consecutive episodes. It's actually unintentional. I hadn't planned it that way, but you know, one week I talked about the the China problem. Right, and the incredible difficulty that in the cost that's associated with American publishers, with Western publishers, getting their games into China. Uh, and then the following week, I talked about the Japanese problem, um, and the problem that Westerners have in uh, in deploying their games in Japan. Uh, and, and then I kind of synthesized across those two conversations today. Uh, one of the analogs that I made was, you know. Um, Napoleon convinced himself that he was going to invade Russia and secure their surrender in six months and be home before the Russian winter set in. Yeah, it didn't um, happen. 
And that wasn't the case. No. Um, and I kind of feel like a lot of what we're seeing and hearing now is very analogous. Are you, um, wait, 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 I, logic. Are you, are you comparing Phil Spencer to Napoleon? Oh, uh, well, you know. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then we also had, uh, you know, another thing that I posted was um, Atari kind of went down this path a lot as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, someone said he's calling yeah. Phil short. That's not, <laughs> I'm that's not sure. Not, that's how, not what how tall we're doing is here? <laughs> how, t- how tall is Phil Spencer? <laughs> uh, I, I, I have no idea. I've, I, I've never met the man in person. I should ask Tim Dog. I don't. Know. He's fi- he's he's five he's five nine. Is he five nine? He's five I nine. I don't he's know. My, he's my height. I don't know. I don't know if uh, I don't know. Napoleon, what like five? I I don't don't think this is the right Phil Spencer. This is the actor Phil Spencer. So somebody, (laughs) somebody should look up how how tall Phil Spencer is. Um, um, But 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 we're not we're not taking shots of Phil. (laughs) Yeah, Hamps Hamps building this case here. He's using an analogy, but go ahead. I'm I'm also not saying that he has a Napoleon complex. What I'm saying is that right what i feel like and this has long been the case right this is this is after us be observing the trend over 14 years right uh, over 10 years sorry um this has long been the case of kind of convincing themselves that a strategic approach um is going to is going to work and and it's, there are strategic approaches that that i kind of question when i see how they're going to execute on it by and large i i never i don't i have not had a lot of problems with xbox's strategies they they seem to be sensible, right? And and leverage their strengths and hit at Sony's weaknesses. But a lot of times, where I have a problem is, oh well, wait a second, right? But you're executing it in this way. Um, and so what I talked about today is right. I also drew the analog to Atari and what Atari thought they were going to do in Japan, right in the '80s, and where quite honestly, Atari was operating from a position of even better strength than Xbox it was or or is, right? And one of the key problems that tackled Atari by the shoestrings was cultural incompatibility. Their belief that their content was going to hold sway in Japan. And that has not been the case with Xbox in literally its 20 plus year history. It has never gained traction in Japan. So just talking a little bit about the about the, the, the characteristics of the Japanese problem, right? Japan is the third in the world in GDP. Um, they have the third largest gaming market after the U.S. and China, uh, turning some $19.9 billion of revenue in 2022. And so people often talk about the Japanese market as if it's irrelevant. And so people who have maybe seen talking about games, I apologize if you guys are hearing this for the second time. People often talk about the Japanese market as if, as if it is irrelevant, as if the demand signal coming from Japan for types and styles of games, as well as the features desired or, or undesired in consoles, don't have an impact. The fact is that Japanese tastes are very important, as these numbers show. And in fact, Asia, as a geographic region, is one that Xbox needs to win if its strategy of exclusives don't matter, more games on every screen is going to be successful. We also have this dovetail with the comment that Sean Layden made right in a time period that was between these two episodes. And and he said very much the same thing that I've been saying, which is that, look, if 95% of the world doesn't want to play Halo Infinite, Call of Duty, and Fortnite, then how are you going to win by making Call of Duty... Halo Infinite and Fortnite, right? We've, we've proven that that's not going to work and that's not going to lead to growth. But yet we've seen no signals of indication that there's a content pivot coming from Xbox. And this was the thing that I was talking about Wednesday, right? In my opinion, Xbox gets itself very lathered up about the cloud, about platforms, about Azure, about leveraging all of these things that are going to help, right? in the console business and the console space instead of focusing on the dynamics of the actual console business and gamers. We have long held and myself too have held that like Phil like has, has the gamers voice like that he knows what gamers wants. But I think what we need to understand is Phil understands American gamers and Western gamers. And it's what attracted me to Xbox and it's what makes it attractive as American product. But I think what we need to acknowledge is that that dog's not going to hunt on the international stage. In 2021, Nintendo sold more Nintendo Switches in Japan than units combined of PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, and Xbox. Proving that handsets gaming that uh, handset gaming consoles popularity with Japanese gamer gamers. About a third of gamers there play on PC, a number that continues to grow in the region. 58% of the Japanese population are gamers. And of that 58%, 70% are 
our mobile phone our mobile phone owners who also play games. Ninety five percent of those gamers play games at least once a week. Combined, the number of Japanese gamers playing on consoles and PC is about fifty two percent. Most popular console game genres are RPGs at 46%, adventure games at 35%, and simulation games at 32%. On PC, the most popular genres are RPG 32%, shooters 23%, and simulation games 22%. Again, simulation games, some simulation games play well here in the West, but they're, they're not anywhere near that level. Right? When you talk about your Gran Turismo's, your Forza's, your digital combat simulators, Right, that genre doesn't play. Like right, the the point of some of these numbers is that that market is different, and the global market is different, and you're going to see similar data when you look at, you know, at 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 other regions across the globe. Sorry, Amp. I was just talking. My my five year old just walked in here. Um. Uh, so Amp. So I mean, so again, like I, you you bring up a great point about Phil doing a great job of, of bringing content for Western gamers. But, and, and that's, and that's kind of like my point. Like I, I just don't see them making en roads. And so I, I, my, my question is how are they going to grow the brand? How are they going to grow the business? Cause again, there's only a finite group of people that are going to play Western games. Are they going to play video games? And, and so, and, and so for me, the, the next logical step was what you look at the other global markets, but then again, I don't see them making content that appeals to those markets. So I, I don't, I don't know. And maybe, right. who knows, and, maybe behind the it, scenes they're having these conversations, but but my point is I just, I, I don't see it. Well, and well, I, and I'm well, questioning we, it. Yeah. Well, we, certainly, we certainly didn't see evidence of the conversations being had in the in the in in all the emails, right? So we, we've yeah, gotten well, yeah, we see that a, a significant around. insight into, right, what's go, the dynamic that's going on. And we haven't, we haven't seen any indication that there is a focus and a strategy and an acknowledgement and an effort that is behind hey, we need to create different content in order to sell into these other regions. We look at the acquisition strategy. The acquisitions have all been Western studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of them have. You know, And even, even COD's reach isn't necessarily as global as some people might think it is. No. And, but, but, here, but, but my point is this too. It, it goes back to, it, this is where I think People get lost in the minutia of Phil Spencer. Oh, games everywhere! Yeah, just, yeah go ahead. Yeah, just just one thing. I have a couple of people in chat saying that you know they they play a lot of simulation. Somebody talked about their hours. Look, I, I I get it. I am also a big huge simulation fan. I have two wheel and pedal setups here. I have five flight control systems. Right. I have I have more simulation gear in my studio and game room than most gamers have game gear total. I mean, but I'm not the market. I mean, Lodge, you, you have like two, you have like four of my rooms in your one room, <laughs> <laughs> like literally. <laughs> but um, no, but 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 so when people get lost in the, the fill stuff, right? You lost in all the minutia of the fill stuff, and they're like, oh, you know, games everywhere, consoles are dying, cloud, cloud. Remember the whole cloud thing, right? During the acquisition, those things are great. Those delivery systems are are fine, right? But at the end of the day, like. You're not going to attract new people because you have new ways to deliver content. You you have to have content that's going to attract people to those new delivery systems. And so that's the that's what I keep going back to from a global perspective. Where's the content that 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 appeals to those markets? And if it's mobile content, where's that? I understand Candy Crush is huge, but but what else? I mean, people are already playing Candy Crush. That's an established IP. What else? Where are those other end roads? And that's what I keep going back to. At the end of the day, at least to me, logic, it always goes back to one thing, video games. Like uh, George, what's his name? The Raging Cajun said to Bill Clinton. It's about the economy, stupid. And I apply that to video games. It's about gaming. It's about video games, stupid. It's about content. It's always been about content. As great as, uh, and I never played, um, I never used uh Stadia, I think you did, Logic. You could speak to it better than I can. But everyone that I, most people that I know that tried Stadia said it was actually a, a really good technology. It was solid. Yeah, I mean, I, I but, thought Stadia was great. I mean, I, I always envisioned Stadia. There was a lot of negativity around Stadia because people, come, again, like we're talking about, you know, narratives now. People had this narrative that Stadia was trying to replace something. Stadia was never a replacement for me. 
right? But it was it was a great backup. You know, I boot up a PC. It gives me some random error. I don't feel like troubleshooting that crap right then. I shut it down, right? I go somewhere else and I pick up my controller and I play Stadia. You know, I can't I can't get into something or whatever. You know, on a console, you know, I I, I go play Stadia. The, the game comes up. There's no patches I have to deal with. I don't have to deal with drivers. Right? It just shows up. What it what it what it wasn't. It was it wasn't consistent. And so, you know, as I was playing, say, an hour of Destiny 2, again, I go back to, you know, dynamic resolution, <laughs> right? I would, I would see instances where, yeah, I'm getting 4K, but then I would see instances where, oh, no, that, that, is, that is not 4K. And I could see kind of some, some mooring of, you know, of graphical artifacts and stuff on the screen in certain regions, you know, because there was a blip, right, in bandwidth. So You're like wait um, why, why why am I playing Pitfall? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean in general, uh, you know, I was I was pleased with Stadia. I mean, it was for you know ten bucks a month for having access to stuff, and and particularly the the big and again I constantly go on and on about you know users system requirements uh, use cases um, and where and when do you need it right? Stadia was not a good global solution. Stadia, however, and I talk about this now very much with handhelds, people go on and on about how handhelds are, you know, and, and they're going down this path of handhelds being a replacement for consoles. No, handhelds are, in my opinion, handhelds are not a replacement. They're a great replacement for a gaming laptop. And I would certainly rather take my Steam Deck or my Nintendo Switch, you know, or a raw gallery. So I would certainly much gladly, you know, much more gladly hump that on a trip than pack you know, a 10-pound gaming laptop plus its freaking Mongo power supply right you know in a courier bag and hoof that everywhere so but it, you know stadia was a great solution for me um you know just throw a controller and a tablet in a bag and go you know i played it on hotel wi-fi and had a had a great experience you know so you know but you know but again it, it, it had its place and it had its time and it's had its you know scenario yeah but i also don't think i think the, one of the issues with stadia is that it didn't have that killer app the thing that drove people to the platform Right, it had it had a lot of stuff that you could get other places. Exactly, and so that, oh, that's why. The, yeah, go ahead. By the way, even even Google recognized that what they needed to make Stadia go was they needed exclusives. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was what I was about to get to that. Yeah, and that was my point. Like they 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 need it, this is this is always why it's it's about it, it's not about the delivery people. It's about content. It's always been about content. Even if you remove the console, right? You you totally get rid of the consoles. And everyone's like, oh, it's going to be an app. Okay, what's well, going to be an app? What's your differentiator for that app? What's going to put eyes on that app? You know, if, if your games are going everywhere else, what, 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 what's what's the incentive? And I, and I feel like people just kind of skip over that, 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 that one piece. They get wrapped up in the whole, oh, well, you know, this is the future. Okay. But you still need content in that future, because it's an, it's a form of entertainment. You, you you need you need to have something that's going to in, incentivize people to engage on your if it's an application, if it's a game on your mobile device, if it's a storefront, you need something. It's not going to happen by itself. So that's that's my only point. And it all kind of it, it came together again. Logic, like I said to you, came together for me when I looked at that number, and I'm like, wait a minute, they. They really don't have a strategy globally. I don't. I don't think. I could be wrong, but I haven't seen anything. And 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 by the way, I, I'm sure Nintendo and Sony are thinking about these things too. Like Matt indicated, like other other developers or whatever the case is, they're they're thinking about this. And what leads me to believe that Sony's thinking about this and how to grow their market is by some of the 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 incubation projects that they have in China, in India, in Africa. Because again, those consumers are going to want to in, are want to, are going to want to engage with different types of games that we do here in North America, and maybe they want to engage those in, in gaming in, in, in uh, with um, uh, through a console, as the case is in Japan right now. So I do, I don't think that this 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 idea of growth is necessarily uh, an Xbox problem per se. Logic, I want to make that clear too. I think. I, I mean, obviously, you know, Sony and, and, and Nintendo are a little bit of a um, maybe. There's less sense of urgency on their on their parts because they're not in the same position as Microsoft is right now. The Xbox specifically in gaming, but I, I I'm under the impression that Sony's thinking about this too. Again, just based on the work that they're doing in India, in China, in Asia, Africa right now. 
So. Yeah, and we we've talked a lot about you know over the course of yeah. you know the the era of consolidation in the gaming industry over the last two years, um, and we've talked a lot about you know um, y- you know thought leadership and you know some of these acquisitions and and where acquisitions would be beneficial to each of the corporations, right? That you know I don't I don't know that the benefit of onboarding Activision into the Xbox organization was necessarily solely about Call of Duty or even King. Right, but that one thing that I would ascribe value to is that you know those guys have figured out how to take a bunch of studios. I mean, they, they are the largest singular development team in the gaming industry. And somehow they have figured out how to put together this mass production pipeline that fires on all cylinders, delivers every year. And one of my key performance metrics, right, in looking at these companies is when I talk about how do companies face up to adversity and how do they recover and that's much more valuable to me in my opinion than you know a, even a company that just consistently performs great point yeah great point and and you know we we had the speed bump with the call of duty series where you know sledgehammer you know was in and sledgehammer was was not getting along with everyone so i guess sledgehammer and raven was i think where the knit was and 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 so they said hey treyarch can you come in and pinch hit and Treyarch did, and they delivered a game that had as much content as any other Call of Duty, right? Annualized release. I just saw numbers for Call of Duty Vanguard today, and, and somebody's supposing, based on a rumor, that, that that game sold 30 million copies. That is the crappiest version of Call of Duty that has been released in, like, 14 years. <laughs> yeah. And the thing <clears throat> sold 30 million copies. Yeah. What what development team wouldn't love to have the problem of their game selling 30 million copies in a down year <laughs> in, in what is essentially yeah. the worst performing <laughs> year? Oh, geez, we only sold 30 million copies. You guys suck. <laughs> yeah, know? I mean, there's 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 publishers that would that would kill for that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, how, how, you know, the experience of Bungie, you know, should should help out with with Sony and, and I know there's, there's not a good optic around that right now, but still at the end of the day, I, I believe onboarding that, that talent and that experience, you know, is helpful because those people obviously have ideas and obviously have, you know, experience in fields where they've been successful, where, where your organization might not. So you know, those acquisitions aren't only about, you know, IP or, um, you know, or just bodies. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned um, kind of, looking at how a company responds to adversity. I mean, Nintendo with the Wii U. I mean, they, they, I mean, they, they, like you said, they, they literally, I mean, a lot of us thought that they were, they were, they were on the outs. This is it. Nintendo's done. Right. Yeah. But look what they did. And, but again, look, I mean, like, obviously I think the, I mean, it, it, even I was skeptical of the Nintendo switch. But my goodness, man, when they when they launched Mario Odyssey and then and then The Legend of Zelda, oh my God, like within the release window, the launch window. Oh, that was it. Let me grab the super chat here from uh, Twisted Sin. Five dollar super chat. Thank you, sir. The only thing I remember about Stadia was the clip of someone pressing the jump button on Destiny 2. The action didn't happen until one second later. I don't remember that clip. Yeah, and I and I, and I twisted. I, I know twisted sin. He, mm. he and I frequently go back and forth. So I, I don't think you're saying this, but I, I just want to platform off off of what you're saying with some things that I said in the chat. My comments about Stadia were that Stadia was a good cloud streaming service, and it was the it was the best amongst the cloud streaming services that I had experienced, and I tried out mostly all of them. So I played that. I played GeForce Now. I played Xbox Cloud Gaming. Um, my, my comment was simply that amongst those, it was the best, not by any means suggesting that Stadia, again, would be a replacement for my gaming on console or PC. It was a it was a backup. It was a convenience. It was, hey, I'm going to play something late at night and I don't feel like being bothered. It was it's super crappy hot, like in the middle of the summer, <laughs> and I don't want to light off a beast of 12 fans, right? I mean, that's... So yeah, don't people shouldn't construe my statements as me suggesting that you know Stadia you know was a was a winning way forward. Yeah. By the way, I want to address. Uh, uh, oh shoot, I just lost it. Uh, is it Heltig? Heltic Silver said to be fair, when we when you was going on, they had Nintendo DS, and that was sorry. I mean, you're absolutely right. That that is true. 
uh, their their handheld business was was soaring. My only point was uh, the conversation at the time was they should get out of the console business and maybe take some of their console like games to to other platforms. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Vic. Their handheld business was was doing very well. well. Well, their handheld business was also one of the reasons why so many people said that you, they should just go mobile because people yeah, felt yeah. that those games that those were already games. on handheld would also play well on mobile. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Want to grab this uh, super chat here from Street Shadow with the five dollars super chat. Thank you, Street Shadow. Says the thing that irks me with Xbox is that I think they talk too much because they are in ha- they, because they are in headlines and it makes you feel like Xbox varies a market trend. I, I don't. I, I certainly understand that perspective, Street Shadow. I've been very vocal about them just needing to kind of just keep their head down and focus on making great content, and and not just again. Just add this this little bit of nu- this nugget here. Uh, not just great content like we talked about earlier, not just a game like Pentiment, but but a game that's really going to move the needle for for the platform that moves the needle in the industry and the market for them. Something big. I mean, go back and think about the impact that Halo had on the Xbox, the original Xbox. So. Yeah, uh, I, th- you, I think there's something. Super chat, yeah. I think there's something confusing going on in chat. I, th- I think I think somebody. So first of all, the, the the person who said he had never seen the video with the one second lag was not Game Logic. That was Brap who that said was that. Me. Yeah, and I I said I yeah I will say at this juncture I also never saw that video, but I also mentioned how I had the experience of playing on Stadia when I would see, uh, you know, resolution and graphical fidelity drop because of because of lag and latency. So. Who, who, whoever's in the chat saying that, like I or or even either of us said, you know, claimed indications of Stadia not suffering from lag, latency, jitter, uh, or, or bandwidth problems is just categorically incorrect. That's that's not what we said at all. In fact, I've corroborated that the, the the game did suffer from that, and it didn't provide the same reliability and stability that you would have from running something on metal right within your own game room. Yeah, actually, my commentary is more just along the lines of. I actually didn't see that. <laughs> I had, right, had nothing right. to do. I was I wasn't making any commentary on the actual on the actual service itself. It was only that I'd never seen that video. That was it. Yeah, B- BV's asking, did you ever see any lag videos of Stadia? No, I I never did because I never watched any videos of Stadia. I just tr- I, I just tried out the service and I knew that it suffered. Yeah. I, but for, first of all, I've also spent some. I've also spent part of my career as a network architect and a network engineer, so I'm very familiar with the topics of lag, latency, jitter, and ping. So I I don't I don't I don't need to watch a YouTube video to be able to characterize what Stadia's performance was. I, I have the first hand experience and I knew what the problem was. Yeah, I, I never, I never bothered watching any uh, Stadia videos um, on input lag or whatever the case is. Um, I, I, I did hear from some people that um, uh, that that did experience that, but I also heard in comparison to some of the other options um, that Stadia was wasn't bad. But, well, that's why. That's why. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 in fact, I say this about gaming videos, even on console and PC, is that watching them on YouTube is is not representative of your first hand experience. So right in sync with everything that I say about E3 and all these game trailer videos and everybody flipping out because, you know, the game doesn't look the same way as the trailer. Like, I don't I don't pay attention to that stuff. I don't rah rah. I don't get pom pom. I don't get all lathered up because the trailer looked good. I also don't castigate a game hey, in pre-production hey, hey, hey. Whoa, because whoa 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 <laughs> logic like some of us get lathered up for, <laughs> for 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 gameplay trailers for reveal trailers okay there's nothing wrong with that yeah, some of us do I get, get lathered up so <laughs> some of us like to throw around game of the year in the month of right. February, all right. Yeah. I get, I get, I get excited about games when they are delivered. What, what, what is the cliche that I say all the time? Right. Develop your game, test your game, distribute your game, publish your game, right. And I will get excited about your game when I hear that it is not full of bugs, crashes all the time, and that it's actually a reason for me to be excited about um, trailers and and all the build up and the ramp up and the marketing hype. That that that's not what causes me to get excited about a game. No, nor, a, nor, nor a streaming cloud service. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin George, what are we talking about here in the live chat? <laughs> I'm not like I'm not a, what? I must have missed something in the live chat. Oh, uh, uh, maybe because I said lathered up, and that's causing people. No, to... <laughs> no he's saying so. The, he's replying to Lord Metroid, and it's something about. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's happening in the chat, but it, I saw. That. I'm like, what is happening? That's pretty funny. <laughs> It's a weapon? What 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 what? What it's a weapon in the video game? Is that what it's called? <laughs> oh my god. I've never played Shadows of the Damned. 
Okay, so apparently it's a weapon. But is that what the is that what the weapon's called though? Yeah, I've never played Shadows of the Damn Lord Metroid. <laughs> That's what it's called? Oh my god. <laughs> Have you played this game? Have you heard of this game, Logic Shadows of the Damned? I have not. This was what was this a 360 era game? I, I don't know, but like uh, I think Lord Metro would say like a remaster's coming. Um, I'm uh, a <laughs> my god, that is I I don't know if I want to play it. Yeah, the 360. oh yeah, a, a, a remaster is coming. Shadows of the Damned, hella remastered, <laughs> and it was announced uh, last year. It's scheduled to release this year. <laughs> For Nintendo Switch, PS4, PS5, Windows, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X and S. So apparently, what are the weapons called? The Hot Boner. <laughs> what are, are you guys serious? Yeah, is EA is EA public is EA publishing the remaster? Uh, so they so they published the uh, I guess Grasshopper is publishing the remaster. So. <laughs> So, so Kevin's like, it's a game you didn't know you wanted to play, but must. Oh, my God. Oh, it's a battle sink every morning. That's pretty, that's pretty funny. Um, I, I, I just can't believe there's there's a uh, a weapon that's named Hot Boner in that game. That is, um, <laughs> I thought you guys were joking. I want to look at the Metacritic of this game now. Let's see. What's called Shadows of the Damned, right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, game only took three years to make. Oh, well, here we go. So 77, 76 on Metacritic. 2011 action adventure video game developed by uh, Grasshopper Manufacture. Published by EA for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Produced by uh, Shinji Makimi. Uh, I'm sorry. I pronounce, Shin, Shinji Makami, who directed uh, Resident Evil and you know worked on Dino Crisis. And uh, directed the he's Evil also Within. also founded Dangle Game Work, so he's part of this. Now, is he the guy who's now moved on to another studio? Or yeah, created he started, he started studio? a new studio. So the, the, the thing with him, he was at the, he, it sounded like he was going to retire, and then he started his own studio. So what? One of the one of the uh, some of the excitement over Microsoft acquiring Bethesda was that um, that Shinji Mikami was the head of um, Tango uh, that he founded Tango GameWorks. Yeah, so the game, I mean, the, the, the protagonist's name is Garcia Hotspur. He's a Mexican demon hunter. Goes to city. He goes to the city of the dam to battle its evils in order to save his girlfriend Paula, who's captured by the Lord of Demons, Fleming. It looks like um, uh, interesting. All right. Well, I I don't know if this That's, is a game that it's on my I'm radar now. I'll at least I'll at least look out for it. I mean, it's supposed to. It's coming out this year. The uh, remaster. Shadows of the Dam, Hello Remastered. Yeah, coming out, uh, like you said, uh, Nintendo Switch, PS4, PS5, Windows, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, and S. All right, well, Lord Metroid says it's really good. Lord Metroid, have you played... Ah, now, I'm, now I'm brain dumping the name of this game. Shadow... Is it Shadow Warrior? Have you played Shadow Warrior Three? Was that I think that that remaster last year? Did I play? Are you asking me or asking Lord Metroid? Asking Lord Metroid. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kevin George, it really did alter. Uh, did alter the chat. <laughs> I can't believe it's actually a yeah. name of a weapon. No, he, he hasn't played it. Yeah, oh, that's correct. Because because I, I was going to say. The, the, when I when I read the description of this game, that's that's what I'm wondering is like is is this game because I really liked Shadow Warrior three and I think uh, in particular the remaster and I think it got it didn't get as much you know um, hoopla as it should have and I'm wondering how close this game is to something like a Shadow Warrior three. 
you said chat you said shadows of the dam was a 77 metacritic yes yep i mean that's not that's not a terrible score no i mean and you know and, and i don't say this as a derogatory manner but like that's a, that's the perfect type of game to go into game pass yeah no i don't disagree so it was it was so they did so they did the original they did the original on pc oh i'm not sure yeah the remaster is actually uh it's not it's not up for pre-order it can be wish listed on steam though Yeah, it looks like Kevin George played. Uh, Kevin George played Shadow Warrior. He says it was fun. And and Ke- did Kevin also play Shadows of the Dam, the original? Yeah, I think so because he's the one that uh, mentioned Hot Boner. Yeah, I mean, I would. I, I guess my question is, oh, if being that player, do you know? Yeah, d- being that I really enjoyed Shadow Warrior Three Definitive Edition, do, do you think I would also enjoy Shadows of the Dam? Yeah, they're they're going back and forth about lollipop chainsaw now. I never played that. Yeah, I think I, my feeling is lollipop chainsaw is the really perfect kind of game for people who uh, who, who need games like Stellar Blade, where uh, where uh, yeah, where characters are, are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that gentleman who was in our chat last week. <laughs> yeah, so. All right, uh, Logic, uh, that is all for topics this evening. Um, Want to give a big shout to everyone in the live chat. Thanks so much for hanging out with us for the last two hours here. Appreciate the support as always. We have about 182 people watching. Please hit that like button. It helps out the channel. And if you're new, subscribe, hit the bell notification so you are alerted when we go live. Appreciate the support as always, everyone. means a lot. Thank you so much for the super chats as well. Really appreciate those. And Logic, uh, if you want to be found, uh, let everyone know where they can find you. Uh, yeah, you guys can catch me on the uh, Enough to Keep Going Weekly Games podcast uh, on the E2KG Network podcasting channel on YouTube, uh, 8.45 p.m. on Sunday nights. Uh, I am also working on a script for uh, the next Talking About Games. I think that'll be episode 10. Yeah, episode 10. Uh, I'm all over the place when that one is going to be live, so I, I can't give you a date um it is a particularly nasty script and i hate summer game fest already because i'm trying to pull together a briefing on uh on ubisoft's uh intended showcase but in order to do that i'm trying to pull together the report card of everything they announced last year and whether that stuff has uh has come out or been delayed and uh, if it did come out uh how it performed on metacritic and sales wise so it's taken a significant amount of time to uh pull together in fact, my, us- my script for those shows are usually like three to five pages, and I think the script for the Ubisoft section is already like three pages, so it's a big pain in the ass. But it should be, it should hopefully be going up, uh, and uh, and I'll be doing it live, hopefully here within the next week or so. I hope. Awesome, awesome, man. Um, and then if you want to follow me, you can follow me on the Twitters or X Brap underscore Podcast, and then of course here every Wednesday night at nine p.m. Eastern Time. Please check out our show this past Wednesday with special guest Detective Seeds. It was a great show. It's myself, Seeds, Game Logic, and Gaming Forte. Again, check it out. Great conversation there as well. And uh, everyone, have a great weekend, by the way. Hopefully you get some gaming in. Hopefully you have some fun playing video games because ultimately that's what it's all about, having fun. So until then, we'll catch you next time. Thank you again. <laughs>